Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, I'm Vasilos Karakasis, uh, currently working um, at NVIDIA as a senior performance engineer. Formerly, formerly I was at CSCS, so most of, uh, several people from this audience know me already. Uh, and I'm uh, basically now a free time contributor to uh, Reframe, but I'm, I'm a user of it as well, also in my daily work. Um, and today uh, we're going to present with Selfindos the recent advances in the framework. We haven't done this presentation since the last uh, year's um, EasyBuild user meeting, and it's already like almost one and a half years, so there's lots of things that they have happened. So I will start to try to be quick uh, so as not to overrun uh, the time because there's enough of things. So. The presentation is practically in two parts. My part, uh, I'm gonna give like a community update, um, an overview of the, the frame for the zero changes. And also I'm gonna present some of the less, of the pre for, for the zero features that are less well known. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, with some examples. And then Theophilus is gonna focus more on the programmable configuration. Uh, that's uh, uh, featuring the frame from quite a long ago, almost from the beginning, and how you can leverage this to do container-based testing and also user environment-based testing. Um, yeah, most of you know already what Reframe is, but here is like a, a recap. So it's it, it's a framework for writing um, system testing and a system and performance test that has um, HPC features. It's not limited necessarily to HPC, although it was it was it has started from HPC, but you can uh, really run it from your laptop or for other users. And the key advantages is the way you write the test, it's, which is a very composable way. Uh, you can compose tests. There's um, you can define variables, parameters. Um, you can have test dependencies and so on. Um, and there is also support for several uh, HPC schedulers, module systems, as well as build systems and container and times integration with um, Elastic and Graylog so that you can feed directly the performance data of your tests. Also CI integration and uh, tests are also executed in parallel and the runtime takes care of that. Um, yeah, the community has, has grown since last year um, and we're happy about that. We have about three to, 140, three, three to 400 unique readers from all over the world uh, monthly uh, uh, for the docs. And we have our Slack uh, workspace has more than 230 members. We recently updated the link due to Heroku becoming like no more free. And also uh, Slack now has a, um, uh, an invite link, a permanent invite link. So you can use this link to join the, uh, the, the, the group where basically um, asking for support questions or whatever else you're interested about to refrain. Uh, GitHub, um, yeah, since last year, yeah, we have moved the repo um, under the Reframe HPC GitHub group. Uh, and this group also holds some public forks of site test repositories. So we want to make it like a, a place where uh, it, it, it acts as a reference uh, so that other people can find like tests and examples from uh, what sites are doing. So, uh, yeah, it's it's it becomes gradually a community project as we have like uh, little contributions from uh, from up up to forty five contributors since the beginning, um, and we have the backlog which is which is public and you can see it uh, in the Refrain HPC org, um, and yeah, don't hesitate to give it a start, and there is also a PyP package. And which is quite popular there. I don't know how accurate this Pepitech metric is, uh, but it also shows a weird thing that 3.11.2 version is the most popular one. I don't know, probably a CI bot is downloading, downloading, I don't know, sometimes a day. I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting. Um, yeah, we, we did some changes in the way we're uh, moving on with development since 4.0. So we introduced a develop branch. Um, and so all new features go to this, and also the latest docs point to this, and it's also the default branch. Uh, master remains as the release branch, so every release goes through master. 
And also bug fixes, documentation updates, and uh, minor enhancements target directly uh, master. And periodically, we have uh, we sync the two branches. Um, the advantages why we ended up with this is that we have quick release cycles for bug fixes. So one or two weeks, and then uh, and then we can also more accurately follow the semantic versioning scheme. So whenever you see a patch uh, bump, patch level bump level, it is indeed like either a documentation update or a bug fix. Before in, in the past, we might have been adding also some functionality. Uh, now this happens uh, only um, uh, when we have a new release. Uh, the disadvantage is that we have to sync the two branches, but so far this has worked good for us. Uh, and yeah, it might be a bit confusing if you want to contribute as of to which branch you should, but there is a small guide um, for contributing. Uh, now, starting with the changes um, in Reframe.4, all of the deprecated features in 3.x has have been brought so dropped. So if you're getting deprecations 3.x and you want to move to reframe.4, you will have to fix those deprecations. Otherwise, uh, you will have errors. Uh, we introduced one more de one big deprecation in four, which is the variables attribute or the variables uh, configuration parameters for the environments. Now this is called nvars to more accurately match what exactly is. Um, and so you might get lots of deprecations if as soon as you move to reframe dot four to reframe four. But especially for tests, this is really a set like uh, replacement, so it should be easy to fix. Uh, now, some of the new features is that uh, the configuration can, now the configuration can be changed. Uh, we we did have scoping in the configuration through these target uh, systems. Uh, also in the past, uh, where parts of the configuration were to be targeted only for specific systems or partitions. Uh, but now you can split the configuration in multiple files, and all these will be combined, and you can change them either from the command line or through environment variables. And uh, this is quite helpful because, for example, this configuration here is a valid minimal configuration. So you define your system. And the environments relative to, the, to, to that system. You don't have to copy anymore any configuration from the frame itself, add sections that you uh, don't want to play with, like the logging or um, or add systems that you don't, don't get, like the built-in, etc. These are combined automatically. Um, now, the, the file log also log handler for handling performance logging has um, been revised fundamentally. Um, and generally reporting and performance logging, especially on the file, on the traditional way of logging was a bit uh, left behind, I would say. Um, but with 4.0, I think it takes um, another, another spin. So the default output is, like, is CSV. Uh, so that it can be easily post-processed and then you can import it whatever you want and get your performance data. If you don't want to use other, other means of like sending the data to Elastic, et cetera. Uh, we also print a header line in every file. And if for whatever reason, this header line changes, and that could be because you add a new performance, start a new performance variable for your test, um, or you change the way you name it, a new log file will be generated with the updated header. So uh, then you have your logs uh, uh, cleaner um, and they're not mixed up. Another, another thing is the custom parallel launchers. We have seen that several sites have really uh, need to do some small tweaks or so they have even their really custom launchers. And in the past, you have to do that inside the framework. So either you have to submit a PR or you have to maintain a separate form. Uh, now there's no need to do this as you can do that in the configuration file. Uh, I have an example later on, so I will show you how. But if 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 your launcher is is uh, is good for the community, yeah, please submit a PR. That's uh, that's the purpose of it. We have two new backends. Uh, we support the container container platform. It's basically, uh, yeah, same as the singularity. And thanks to 
Vanessa's contribution, um, uh, Vanessa's sources, we have the Flux framework support. Uh, yeah. Another thing in 4.0 is um, uh, the new naming scheme. So we introduce a new naming scheme, especially for parameterized tests and tests with fixtures. It doesn't affect the classical test uh, tests. Um, and now the name encodes um, the information, nice information in a more re human readable way. So you can see, for example, the name of the test, uh, the parameters after a colon, and there is an associated hash. And then you can also optionally see the test case info that is where on which partition and with which environment this is going to run. So you can have now an idea of exactly what's going to run if you just list the test. Uh, then you get the dependencies uh, and then the fixture scope um, and also the variable name of where the fixture is bound. And that's useful for example in this example because for example if you want if you want to set a, a variable in a, in a deeply nested uh, fixture, uh, you can track it through through the names of those variables. So for example, here you could say also or, or reduce test, dot also binaries, dot also benchmarks, dot version, and change the version that you download. Test can, can be um, uh, filtered by name, by, their, by hash, or by their variant number. Uh, all with a minus an option. And some post 4.0 features that are interesting is the um, uh, dry run option uh, that was introduced in 4.1 and basically generates all the scripts that will be executed and it tries to validate as much as possible of the test. It doesn't execute the test. Um, normally it should work out of the box, but there might be cases that your test assumes that some something is produced uh, because the because it has run. Assume that it has run. So then your test can still adapt to the dry run mode by calling the set is is dry run. Um, we we now allow to do custom for formatting of JSON records that are, are to be sent to Elastic. Uh, and the reason for that is that some Elastic servers uh, might impose some schemas, and those are are entirely um, uh, site-specific. I have an example showing how to do that. And a fresh, really fresh one um, is the reruns and duration options that are for uh, from Refrain 4.2, which was released uh, last Friday. Uh, so the idea is that you rerun the session multiple times with the rerun options, or you rerun it for a certain period of time. And the statistics you get, you get them from all the runs. It's it's not like the max retries option. But of course you you should yeah, use use with care. Um, this one especially it, because that can be used also for stress testing the system. Um, yeah, going a bit to other features now. Um, this one is is really something that has come out from discussions from this community and the easy community. Um, where the problem was that with prior versions of Refrain was that the tests were somehow bound to to the actual system to to the system or the environment by binding essentially uh, the system name in the valid systems and the environment name in the environment in the valid product environment. So since three point eleven, we have completely changed that. So. In the configuration, you can have define features or extras, which those are selectable um, in your test. So you can say, for example, the valid system is plus CPU plus IB, and that means that this test is valid for any system that defines the CPU and IB feature. Or it can be an OR, like with comma in this list, or CUDA, for example, uh, this test is going to be valid for any programming environment that's going to be tested on a specific system that does not uh, have CUDA features, feature. Or you can have, um, you can match uh, specific extra values. And that's kind of completely decouples and makes the problem of defining, uh, it's basically defining a contract of uh, feature names 
and attributes. We have not standardized any of those in the frame, and that's we kind of uh, leave it to, to the sides and perhaps um, a community effort of standardization of those things comes up and that could be really helpful. Theo has more in his part uh, in that. Uh, one other couple of other features that are quite interesting is the minus S option, which is setting the test variables from the command line. That's, I, I use it like very often because you can modify the behavior of the test uh, from the command line. And this is from 3.8 with subsequent refinements. I, I totally recommend to use variables and use that option. Others as the repeat and distribute options, which can especially the repeat re clones the test practically and runs n times, whereas the distribute can distribute the test, single node test on individual nodes and run them and pin them on the nodes. Another useful option um, that is, is popular and is it's now already like a couple of years old, is the CI generate. Um, and where Refrain can generate GitLab CI child pipelines where it will run different tests. And now we have added support for the test to add, um, uh, to basically modify the generated CI pipeline. Uh, another one that was, I, I kind of rediscovered recently and it's a pretty pretty old feature since 2.5 i was looking at the, at the history to see when this was ever used is the minus or minus mode command and i remember when the, this was introduced the idea was that you don't have uh especially when you want to hand off a, a, a suite to somebody else to run you don't want them to remember a whole bunch of command line options but it turns out that especially if you do like performance testing or working interactively, or you want somehow to record um, the, the way you have run some experiments, it's it's perfect fit because you name the experiment and you your options, and then very easily you can combine them. Uh, for example, here I'm, I'm just running the bare, the, the bare uh, mode or like the bare experiment, the baseline experiment, which is all of these options. And then, oh, what if I increase, for example, clients to 10? Or what if I set another variable in my test? And then, of course, you can also change like um, other options because those options will take precedence over those in the mode. Um, yeah, that's the programmable configuration. I will probably uh, skip that due to time because Dale will gonna, is going to cover that. And yeah, I'm, I'm gonna just go to some of the examples, which I promised from example, here is the custom launcher. Um, so here it's very easy. So you just define your launcher and it has a single command that takes the job instance. You can find what the fields of the job um, are in the, uh, in the docs. Uh, you register it with a name and all that in your config and then you can use it. And here is, is the, the example with a custom record formatter uh, where you define like the HTTP JSON uh, that's going to talk to an Elastic server and you say, okay, I want to format, to change the way it is format the, the record before it's being sent. And for example, in this case, I'm just adding um, the my underscore prefix. And these are also in the documentation that you can also uh, see. Now, coming to an end, okay. And here is a, a very interesting, but quite advanced feature. Um, this is called the make test API call that basically allows you to create tests programmatically. So for example, this test here is class hello test. You can create it programmatically here with the make test, giving it the class name, the base classes, the body of the class, the methods and so on. And then you can use, of course, the decorators, you can use as, as you would here. So if you see there is almost one-to-one -one uh, matching. And that's very powerful because you can, it opens completely new horizons in how you can build on top of the frame itself. And in fact, I was, I was, I wanted at some point to, I had some workflows uh, that's not stream workflows, but other workflows that, 
I wanted to combine and run it parallel, but I didn't want to, um, to write a huge big test file and this could be also, I want it to be dynamic. So here I have the same with the stream benchmark. And for example, imagine that you have written a stream benchmark um, as, as, there are, as, as it is in the tutorial, but then you want something on top of that, like domain specific. And you have this, and here I, I have a mini language, for example, stream workflows, and then some of the variables of the test, and also a thread scaling if I want to scale it. And now this spec is generating those tests. Now I have, I have skipped some of those. Um, and then you see tests there and their fixtures and so on. And this is literally happening with this, um, with this code. There are some imports that I didn't have enough space to put in. Uh, but the key idea is that everything happened in a normal test file that you would you would load with the minus C option. Now the spec file is passed an environment variable that's called stream spec file here and loads the specification in YAML. And then from that specification, we generate the test using the make test. And finally, we register them, we register them to the framework with the RFM simple test. So it really allows you to build on top uh, of reframe and essentially use all the machinery and all the feature it has, but build on that's that's a bit advanced, but also quite cool. I mean, it it might have like edge cases and um, edge use cases, but it's interesting. I'm not gonna go through this example um, for the sake of time, um, and but there is this pull request because the idea is that. Uh, to convert this to a tutorial so the people can try it. Uh, so the example, the whole code is in the pull request yet, but there's no text. So the only text about it is what I said <laughs> in this presentation. Um, now, as future outlook, one thing we wanted to improve is really the uh, reporting and post-processing of reports. We do generate like detailed reports but it's not easy, for example, to search and compare with past reports, et cetera, et cetera. And that, as you're kind of daily using it, is something that um, yeah, you're, you're kind of missing. And it's something that has come as a request from several people. Um, another, another interesting thing is generalizing the system entry auto detection method so that it can be it can be easier adaptable to other environments like more cloud-based, uh, where, for example, the host name is not the way to pick the, it doesn't give you anything about the, the, this, your system and it can be a random host name. So you want a different way to retrieve something that you could use to identify which, which uh, configuration entry to, to uh, work. There is a, a already um, a draft PR that would address this. It's a first attempt to address this, uh, and we will plan to merge that in four to three, hopefully. Um, yeah, other is like whoever has worked with test parameterization, or however cool it is, you end up okay. What if if I change that parameter like to different range? Then you realize you have to go to your test and change that. Or what if I have a body and I want to create a parameter out of it? This you, again, you have to do it manually. So this would be really easy to. Ideal if you could do it from the command line, and also perhaps generalize the way test victory. And as I said, I mean uh, we're very limited bandwidth. It's a community project, and so if you have anything to contribute, you're really welcome to, to do so. So that finishes my part, and I'm giving I'm giving it to Theo now. I hope I didn't go very off. So can you see my presentation? I can see it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. 
So Kenneth, is it okay by your side? Okay, so you can see my, my slides. If not, let me know. So since we are short on time, I will start quickly. So my talk is a continuation of what uh, Vasilis was presenting. So it's called Embracing Reframe Programmable Configurations. So this is a brief outline how uh, the configuration of reframe looks like, the different flavors that we have. Uh, and then I, I will present two use cases to apply what I'm going to talk about. Uh, programmable configuration for container use cases and a user environment based programmable configuration. And then I will end up with some conclusions. So a brief overview of how uh, the reframe configuration looks like. So we have two flavors of the reframe configuration and one is the Python one and one is the JSON. Uh, I will focus on the Python one since it's the one that is fully programmable. So the reason that why I want to go to the programmable pipeline is that up to now, uh, these things, the JSON one and the Python were more or less one-to-one -one in, in the sense that the, the Python, all this information, the Python one were hard-coded. So we expected uh, the system that we uh, that uh, we, we were expecting that the system that we are going to land on had all the features that, and that we are going to test and therefore we gave it the list of tests and uh, it would test all the programming environments according also to uh, specific test requirements so again refrain can work with both the flavors it's easy to go from one uh, type of configuration to the other one via the show config CLI option and save it as a JSON file. And the Python one is the one I will focus on since it's fully programmable. And re as Vasilis already said, Reframe 4 allows splitting the configuration uh, into multiple sub configuration files. And I have here the link to the documentation for uh, the various con configuration options that uh, the frame accepts. So how the programmable configuration looks like for containers. So when I was, I, I started uh, looking into how we can start testing containers. In fact, con each container can have very different features and therefore I cannot give the whole set of uh, of tests that we have at CSCS, for example, and uh, assume that the containers offer all this uh, that the test required to be tested. So in fact, we can actually use the label instructions of a Docker file. Singularity has also something similar for uh, passing metadata to your container image. And you see here, for example, I can pass information that can be reframe specific. And here I say that this image provides OZU micro benchmarks, provides MPI, serial uh, compilation, OpenMP, and CUDA. And here I, I describe uh, what the compilers looks like. Here it's MPI, CC, MPI, C++, MPI, F90. Here we have a similar one, but uh, without the uh, CUDA version of OZU micro benchmarks. And here we have another image which can provide LAMPs, for example. And here we have another one with uh, a CUDA version of Gromax. And this uh, metadata that are, is going to be added uh, to, to the image once it's created can be accessed at runtime and be uh, used to program the configuration that is going to be generated. So I will show how all this is, how this workflow looks like. So for the programmable configuration, instead of having a hard-coded configuration, you pass uh, the container images that you want to test as an environment variable. You get the image names uh, with this here. Then you can inspect using Scopeo each image and retrieve the features uh, of each image. Uh, and use the image name as an actual programming environment. 
Therefore, here I create for each image uh, an actual reframe environment, and I use I pass the features and every other information that is specific to reframe to the features of the environment and the CC, for example, or, or all the compiler settings that I want. Then I assign to a specific partition of my system the environment names. And finally, I put the actual environments that I created in step four into the site configuration. And this is the actual, uh, uh, the, the actual variable that the reframe needs in order to, to understand what the configuration of this environment is. So more or less, the, the final site configuration for each of my target partition will contain a programming environment for each specific container. And therefore, through this, the actual, uh, feed, the actual features that the container image uh, says that it provides can actually be tested by the corresponding reframe tests. So how on the test side, how this looks like is, for example, I have here uh, the reframe test using the features. In the past, I would say that my valid systems would be here, for example, dined, uh, are pitch dined and the GPU partition or pitch dined for VMC partition. So here I say that I don't require something very specific from the environment, but from the system, but from the environment point of view, I require that uh, this environment provides me with OZU micro benchmarks. And here, since it's uh, a container, uh, this is a test that is going to run via the container platform. I access the image through the environment variables that are passed uh, via the programmable configuration. The difference here for the uh, CUDA version of the OZU latency test is that not only my programming environment needs to provide the OZU by benchmarks and CUDA, but now my actual system has to have a, an NVIDIA GPU. So these are going to be taken into account and the reframe will find out in which test will have to run in which system and which programming environment, which here is our container. And to put it all together, here is how it looks. I just use the, here I call it RFM container image. I pass it a, a list of images split it by a, a semicolon. And then I did the dry run here because otherwise it would not fit into the page. But I passed three container images and the reframe knows and maps which tests are required to test the features of its image. So for the lamps image, you see here and uh, lamps, uh, uh, here is my username on, on Docker Hub, but here a lamps latest uh, programming environment corresponding to the lamps image here is created. And all the lamps check that are needed are going to run using this container image. Then I have two flavors uh, of OZU micro benchmark. One uh, provides CUDA and is based on MVAP H2. The other one does not provide CUDA and it's based on MPITS. I just have, have them here to illustrate the concepts. So here you see that the CUDA, the OZU bandwidth CUDA test will run only on the GPU partition on Dynt. And for these container images that actually provide both the OZU micro benchmarks and the CUDA. So here are all the tests that are going to run. And this is very easy to, to let Reframe do the mapping between what the image says that uh, I'm providing as features and Reframe knows and will run the corresponding tests to test if these features actually uh, are working properly and are performing also uh, as expected. Now, I will show you the same concept more or less, but here using something that we are developing at Reframe, which is called user environments. So in a nutshell, user environment are more or less SQLFS images, which contain a software stack, which can be comprised of one or more programming environments. 
So uh, they are created using a Stackinate, a CSS developed CLI tool called Stackinator. And we pass a YAML file which describes more or less the, the components of the software stack. And using another uh, CS developed uh, uh, tool, which is a Slurm plugin actually, you mount uh, at runtime via your batch script, uh, this uh, SquashFS image on a specific uh, uh, mount point, so you can access it on your compute nodes. And uh, the good thing about this uh, user environment is that they can make use of host libraries that, uh, and he, that's the basic difference, the one very important difference between the user environment and container images, because some host libraries, for example, to take full advantage of the uh, proprietary interconnect are uh, on the host and are needed for best performance. And each of these QuasFS images is accompanied by a YAML file, which is currently an, a work in progress, which is consumed by a reframe. And it's more or less a similar thing to the metadata that are provided by, by the container image. And this is consumed by reframe and it uh, using the features of the environment and their names, we can again use the programmable configuration and let Reframe do the mapping and testing uh, uh, for, for us. So here is how I, this YAML file looks like. For example, I have two programming environments. Here, the, the one is called Cray. I have also the modules that might be needed for this programming environment to work correctly. And here I have a LAMPS one, and each one gives me the features that the environment uh, provides. So it's more or less the same as the labels in the Docker files that I showed previously. And again, here, similarly to instead of inspecting using Scopel, now I retrieve the image path passed using environment variables, but you can set it up also to, to accept uh, CLI options. Here I pass the image path and the user mount point that the user can provide uh, to the Slurm options. So I use them as access options that are going to be used by the scheduler. And here I open uh, the, the YAML file to consume the metadata of the image. I get the environment names. I use them as uh, the partition environments. And I pass the module path to, to use uh, the module path as a prepare command. This is optional if you're not based on module, on a module system. And here, again, I create the actual environments and use the, the features that I retrieved for the YAM file. I create the environment and pass them to the final site configurations. So putting it all together again, here I export the UN file and then I can run all the different tests. Here I run for an environment that provided only MPI, an MPI compiler which has also OpenMP, it also it allows for serial, serial compilation and also offers OSU micro benchmarks. And again, here you see that the OSU micro benchmarks uh, that uh, would provide CUDA, for example, uh, here the OSU latency CUDA are only run in a partition that actually specifies it has provides an NVIDIA GPU for you. So here there's a large list that uh, I trimmed a little bit. There's a large list of environments to test all the features for each uh, programming environment that this uh, uh, so, uh, user environment provides. So to conclude, the programmable configuration, as I have shown, gives full access to the Python language and the libraries, so it can be very expressive. Uh, the final configuration can be generated on the fly based on the environments and systems that are tested. Uh, and uh, the, this generation of the configuration on the fly 
moves the responsibility of on the actual environments to state which features they provide and they want to be they want to be tested by reframe. So labels in container images is a useful way to pass this metadata that, in, that reframe needs uh, as features to map the, the regression tests. And by inspecting the features that the user, so, user environment stacks provide via the YAML file for the moment, reframe can test the corresponding functionality for you. So thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy to, uh, to answer any questions that you might have. So yes, yeah. Kenneth. OK, thank you, um, Theo and Vasilios. Do we have any, any questions? Maybe have time for one. It's a very, very deep talk, I think, very technical. So if people not familiar with Reframe, this was not easy. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some very interesting developments being done. I'm mostly looking at Kaspar here. Maybe Kaspar has, no? Everything was perfectly clear. Yeah, no. <laughs> Probably, okay. yeah, it was too deep, as you said. But at least it's there, so people can look at it as a reference. Can you repeat that, Fazilius? Yeah, perhaps it was, yeah too deep or like assume like really knowledge good knowledge of refrain but at least um, it's there as a presentation so it can be used as a reference uh, for future uh, in case people encounter the same things yeah indeed yeah so it was fully recorded it will be made available online yeah there's a, there's a question in zoom okay i can raise this one Ah, that's a good one. So test names are looking more and more like a spec naming scheme. Um, and the question is, is, is that intentional? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we got inspiration from that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's the context is different, but essentially SPAC uses, I mean, symbols that they are not like interpreted by, by shell. Uh, but for example, the dependency symbol is the same, but then we overload them. Essentially, and the reason is that those symbols there you don't have to uh, escape them. But yeah, and besides that, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to say that, but I I like those like little language of like specs in 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 Spark. But um, yeah, we use it with a completely different meaning though, except the carrot. Okay, thank you very much. We'll wrap up here. Thanks a lot.